Good afternoon, and welcome to Blueprint for Efficiency, a webinar speaker series hosted by the Yale Center for Bus Business and the Environment. My name is Joe Tang, and I'll be your host for this afternoon's presentation titled Achieving Continual Energy Efficiency Improvement Through Superior Energy Performance. The Yale Center for Business and the Environment is pleased to present our fifth annual online webinar series. This year's series will emphasize the latest developments and opportunities for energy efficiency in the private sector. Through weekly presentations from leaders in the corporate, nonprofit, and public-private arenas, we will explore a range of topics around energy efficiency. We are very happy today to host, to host Paul Schein, Acting Supervisor of Technology Deployment at the U.S. Department of Energy's Advanced Manufacturing Office, and Stephen Purette, Environmental Manager at the Volvo New River Valley Plant. First, a word about today's talk. Whether working to meet corporate sustainability goals, achieve energy cost reduction targets, establish credentials as a green manufacturer, or prepare for future regulations on carbon emissions, or all of the above, industrial players are seeking to, international, to be internationally recognized for plans improving energy efficiency. The Department of Energy's Superior Energy Performance Program is a market-based, globally accepted certification program that provides industrial and commercial facilities with a roadmap for achieving continual improvement in energy efficiency while boosting competitiveness. This webinar will provide a unique opportunity to get an inside look at the superior energy performance from two important perspectives. As a DOE lead working on the development of the superior energy performance program, Paul Schein will offer his insights in the establishment of the partnership with, with industry in the U.S. And as environmental manager for Volvo's New River Valley plant, Stephen Purette will share his experience as one of the early industrial participants in this groundbreaking program. Next, a quick word about our speakers. Paul Schein is the acting supervisor of the technology of the technology deployment team within the Department of Energy's Advanced Manufacturing Office. He is also the DOE lead working on the development of the Superior Energy Performance Certification Program in partnership with U.S. industry. He is also a member of the U.S. Technical Advisory Group developing the ISO 50001 Energy Management Standard. Paul has worked for the Department of Energy since 1988. He has developed he has developed with U.S. industry a variety of research, development, and technology deployment partnerships and initiatives that all aim to encourage a more rapid adoption of energy-efficient industrial technologies. Prior to DOE, he worked for five years at Garrett Turbine Engine Company in Phoenix and five years with Westinghouse Electric Corporation in Concordville, Pennsylvania. Um, Stephen Purette is the environmental manager for Volvo North, American, Volvo North America's New River Valley Truck Manufacturing Plant in Dublin, Virginia. Steve has over 38 years of environmental experience with the EPA and Department of Defense Contractors, Consulting, and Industry. At the New River Valley Plant, Mr. Purette has managed environmental projects and programs that have led to the plant receiving the Virginia Governor's Award for Environmental Excellence in several areas, including wastewater recycling and energy. Most recently, as project manager for Volvo Trucks, he has led the effort for the New River Valley Plant to be the first plant in the U.S. to achieve the combined certification for ISO 50001 and superior energy performance. Please welcome Paul and Steve to Blueprint for Efficiency. Take it away, Paul. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I will give an overview of superior energy performance and a status of where we are and hopefully give you a good idea of how the program works. There we go. Okay. Um, if you look at um, opportunities within the industrial manufacturing sector, we feel that there's at least 10 to 30 percent of efficiency opportunity. And this, this opportunity could be uh, many times achieved with operational changes um, of how the, the energy is managed within a facility. Um, and then the installation of new technology would give further uh, efficiency improvement. So it is with uh, SEP and ISO 50001 that we're really um, expecting to see uh, facilities start to find the low-cost, no-cost energy saving opportunity. And Stephen will actually describe how Volvo did just that. Um, so um, we also feel that actively managing energy requires an organization changing culture. Very important. Top management needs to be engaged um, on an ongoing basis to give full support of the energy program. And at the core, energy management requires uh, people to change their behavior and uh, to sustain the change. So if you look at the opportunity and challenge of energy management, it's, it's more than um, the facility, the equipment, the processes. It's all about uh, people and personnel and how uh, the team is working with each other 
to drive continual improvement in a systematic way. Superior performance is therefore designed to uh, bring about and um, kind of support that culture change, that systematic view, uh, building off of previous management systems that are in the marketplace um, to bring that whole uh, thinking to the energy um, uh, focus. Uh, it is a market-based program that is, is um, ANSI ANAV accredited, and uh, it provides both industrial and commercial facilities, although right now it's been uh, especially um, focused on industrial. The commercial program is coming up to speed uh, to give a roadmap for achieving continual improvement in the energy efficiency area, uh, and while boosting and respecting any companies need to remain competitive and to look at the cost effectiveness of implementing energy efficiency. Um, it is intended to be all about continual improvement of energy performance, uh, create a uh, transparent system to validate energy performance improvement and management practices. We designed it to make it uh, applicable to a broad array of industrial companies, not just one sector, not just very large plants, uh, to get broad-based uh, market adoption. And then we feel very strongly that in order for this program to be successful, we need to support and build the energy efficiency market and workforce to have people with certain skills that can um, assist the plants in implementing the program. And of course, of course we need uh, a third-party auditing um, industry to, um, to verify the uh, certification requirements. <clears throat> the goal is to launch the program this October. Right now we are in a demonstration uh, stage. To get certified, there's two requirements. Um, one is to implement the ISO 50001 energy management standard, to conform to that standard. And two, is to improve the energy performance of your manufacturing facility by at least 5% over three years. And that's a normalized energy intensity improvement, not just strict uh, absolute energy reduction. So both of those things have to be um, verified by a third party. ISO 50001 um, is a really, um, that was a big milestone to, to get that uh, standard out this past June. Um, this is the world energy management standard. It follows in um, uh, a similar pattern uh, or structure in the plan, do, check, act model as ISO 9000 does for quality, ISO 14000 does for environmental management systems and other ISO management system standards. What it does, um, maybe a little differently, and Stephen will get into this, is it's very data-driven. Um, it, it will uh, require a lot more rigor in terms of energy performance measurement, uh, uh, documentation, and um, you know the, the actual attention to putting real projects in place to save energy. And Stephen will talk about that in terms of the Volvo audit, because they, they have already done 14,000. And he will give some contrast of that, those two standards. Um, it's a very important standard, since 60% of the world's energy is comprised with industrial or commercial facilities. So it's not that we would get full market penetration of that 60%, but 60% of the world's energy is in those two sectors. Um, we feel that companies could use the 50,001 standard for this, their sustainability programs, since energy is such an important part of sustainability. Of course, energy cost reduction, uh, supply chains could use it, uh, maybe future potential greenhouse gas programs that would um, be used within country. Uh, the US actually has co-led this with Brazil and uh, with the United Kingdom and uh, China also part of the uh, leadership team. Uh, currently, there are 56 countries on 
what's called uh, Technical Committee uh, 242, TC 242. And uh, the standard was out this past June, and we are now in a, what's called a TC mode, which means we can build upon the basic ISO 50001 standard to develop more uh, related and, and complementary standards around auditing, around guidance, and around measurement verification as an example. So this uh, gives you examples uh, of what's in the standard, uh, some key parts, an energy policy, form a team across your company, your facility or corporation, have an energy planning process, set your baseline, uh, again, uh, a very data-driven uh, standard, uh, set your key performance indicators, uh, energy performance indicators, have some objectives and targets for energy, action plans that are you're actually going to put projects in place, uh, controls, procedures, uh, of course measure, manage, document, and then have an internal auditing process as the other uh, management systems have that. Now what SEP does is, is it puts a wrapper around the ISO 50001 standard and adds actual performance improvement criteria over and above what 50001 would require. 50001 says you have to continually improve, which means it's a number greater than zero, right? What SEP does is give specific um, energy performance uh, achievement thresholds. Uh, the minimum for silver is 5% over three years where you would follow what we call the, the energy performance pathway here. Um, sorry, this, up, this pathway. Uh, gold would be 10%, platinum 15%. Now, some facilities might find it difficult even to achieve the 5% over three years uh, that maybe have invested heavily in energy efficiency. And therefore, we added this mature energy pathway where the company would have to improve 15% over 10 years and then also show um, a best practice in energy management over and above the ISO standard where they would fill out a scorecard. Uh, no company has uh, gone down this path yet, uh, but we have a few companies that are interested and so we're wanting to test that um, pathway out. There are currently five facilities that have been certified uh, this was in the Texas pilot, um, and um, this is where we call this the alpha pilot. This is where we cut our teeth to design the program and um, ended up certifying the very first plants. It turned out they, <coughs> excuse me, they um, they used the American standard at the time, the ANSI MSC 2000-2008, which is fairly consistent with the ISO 5001. There are differences, but for the most part, it's similar. Um, and um, of course, uh, it, it required a uh, third-party audit. And you can see on the right-hand side of this slide the percentage improvements, uh, which are you know pretty impressive, from 6% all the way up to 17%. Uh, an example was this Cook Composites and Polymers got their 14.9% with pretty much no cost, low cost investment. Uh, pretty much operational improvement, uh, whereas I believe the Dow Chemical uh, projects did require some capital investment. Um, let's see. These are the companies uh, that are in the what we call the beta demonstration. Uh, there are about 35 companies in 20 states. Uh, we are testing the ANSI accredited SEP program. Uh, Volvo is the very first company to meet this new ANSI accredited program that uses the ISO 50001. Uh, congratulations to them, and Steve can talk to you more about that in a few minutes. And then um, you can see there's quite a diversity of types of companies, from uh, companies like 3M that are quite diversified in their products, uh, chemical companies, tires, auto, um, chemical companies, plastics, food, uh, all them spices, um, United Technologies, you know, making aerospace equipment, etc. 
And uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, there is an initiative called the Global Superior Energy Performance Partnership, which uh, involves about 10 countries now. And the idea is for um, is to encourage in these countries um, continual improvement programs in energy efficiency. And we are sharing best practices across countries. Uh, the country, the, sorry, the group in GSEP that relates to the energy management part is the energy management group. And um, that is, um, let's see, um, but next slide. We're within this group. We are, as it says, fostering, accelerating energy management and continuous energy improvement um, within industrial and commercial facilities. We are sharing best practices amongst countries and strategies of how the countries are uh, working to um, encourage the adoption of ISO 50001 and continual improvement. Uh, we are leveraging existing resources between countries. Um, and helping our, you know, respective governments to shape these programs. And the goal would be to try to harmonize as much as we can. Uh, we don't expect it to be completely harmonized, but to the extent we can get uh, similarities in program, we think that would be a benefit to uh, companies that are global that would want to adopt an SEP type of program. Um, the DOE has uh, set up a website, which is listed on the bottom of that slide, that would be a good orientation for anyone to uh, get up to speed on ISO 50001. Uh, there are, you know, basic description of what the standard is, some tools you can use from DOE and EPA that were related to the 50001 standard. Um, I just would encourage you to go there just to familiarize yourself. And here are some uh, websites that you might want to go to. Um, the first one I gave you is that ISO 50001 overview page. And then there's the Superior Engine Performance website. Uh, learn more about the demonstrations. Um, go to that. And also the Texas case studies. I think that completes my version. Um, I'm going to hand over to Stephen now. All right. All right. So we should be able to start seeing Stephen's. Can you folks? Let's see. Looks great. Thanks, Paul. Very good. Hello, this is uh, Steve Perret, uh, <clears throat> Volvo uh, Group, North America in uh, Dublin, Virginia. Good afternoon. Um, just wanted to give you a little uh, insight into who we are at Volvo, being a, we're a Euro-based company, and um, we've had an environmental focus uh, since the early 2000s uh, as related to ISO 14000. Um, and early on we've had a requirement for uh, energy mapping and goals for carbon neutral that actually came from uh, Gothenburg uh, being part of the European community. And in the mid-2000s uh, we organized an energy committee uh, and we focused on reducing the energy footprint uh, of the plant. And uh, this was done to minimize uh, what could be an, an eventual investment in, in renewable energy. And so early on there was a, an emphasis uh, on a documenting our baseline for CO2 reductions uh, if we uh, wanted to make future claims. So in, um, subsequently in 2009 we appointed a, an energy advisor and uh, to tackle first the uh, energy mapping effort and then uh, subsequently um, we had a VP general manager come in from Ghent, Belgium, who had uh, negotiated a, an energy fund for us that, that was justified on ba and based on uh, short-term energy savings and replenishment of that fund for future projects. So 
So overall, we've had about a, a decade of energy improvement, um, which in my own mind felt uh, that was a, a driving need for something like ISO 50001 and, and SEP. Um, overall, uh, in that period of time, both on an absolute terms and energy intensity, uh, we had actually uh, reduced our energy use by 38% over approximately a 10-year period. Um, as, as mentioned, we had been very focused on reducing our energy footprint, and uh, and that was very uh, conducive towards meeting the SEP part of the certification. And in more recent uh, period of time, uh, we had uh, participation in DOE Save Energy Now, and they had a 10-year goal for 25% improvement in energy intensity. And in our particular case, we were able to accomplish that in a little bit more in one year at 29.6% uh, improvement in intensity. Um, overall, our goal for 50,001 and SEP was uh, to create a documented system that would uh, allow these energy saving programs to continue and have continual improvement, um, essentially being concerned about future personnel changes. Uh, our greatest energy advocate and the guy that signed a lot of the checks, so to speak, uh, has already moved on to become uh, the lead VP for manufacturing in the Western Hemisphere, so he's no longer uh, just overlooking this particular plant. So with all his successes, he's uh, been promoted and moved on, and we have to also be concerned about uh, some of our elder statesmen or boomers that are uh, looking forward to retirement at most any time, so that would impact our energy program also. So. I see it as a, a way of creating a, a, a legacy for the plant. Um, in terms of having a, a program like this, uh, front office support, management support, senior management, however you describe it at your uh, location, for us is, is a must. Um, we've had our greatest successes at this plant in the past 10 or 12 years uh, when we've had that uh, type of person and type of management at the front office guiding our efforts. And that person also, uh, uh, Patrick Colonon, uh, also supported our participation in the Southeast Demonstration Project with Georgia Tech uh, beginning in 20, mid-2010. And uh, absolutely, he was a driver since he arrived at the plant in 20, 2009. Uh, has an enormous passion for energy and environment, and environment, and uh, actually had created the first carbon neutral plant in Europe with um, three major, two megawatt plus uh, windmills on site, and a biomass plant. So he's very familiar with these uh, type of efforts and uh, very supportive in uh, protecting the environment in that way. Um, his. Uh, Direction to us is if we're going going to go after 50,001 and SEP superior energy performance, then we should do that with the the idea of being first in the U.S. or even the uh, globally, if if at all possible. So that was the driver behind it, and that was the impetus behind us uh, pushing through to be a part of a pilot with ANSI and ANAV and DECRA to uh, achieve this particular certification. A lot of questions I hear and comments I hear from even inside uh, some of my sister plants and companies. Uh, is, do you need another ISO standard? I mean, people can rattle off all the ones that they have now in terms of 9,000, 14,000, 18,000, and, and others, I suppose. Um, for us, I think a major benefit is, again, that the legacy that it creates uh, where you're trying to reduce your energy footprint look at sustainability. Uh, this helps create the system uh, that creates uh, goals within the system through the SEP portion of the program where you're trying to be gold, silver, or platinum. Uh, future managers wouldn't want to drop the ball, at least not here at, at our plant. Uh, they want to be part of the some of the program successes we've had in the past and want to keep those coming. So 
they wouldn't want to be responsible for that kind of activity. So having this in place creates that legacy and uh, that standardization of what this plant's all about and what Volvo represents. A big part of Patrick's, uh, our VP's uh, program, was to create a world-class manufacturing facility and a carbon neutral facility. And so, uh, 50,001 and SEP were a natural outgrowth of that. Um, you're adding ad energy savings and improved uh, financials for uh, what proves to be a very tough manufacturing environment. We already have two or three of our competitors that have um, built major facilities in Mexico, so um, we're always having to think of that competition. So if we can create savings on the energy side, which we have uh, in one particular case, uh, we were able between 2009 and winter of 2009 and winter of 2010, as I recall, um, save on the order of $700,000 just looking at uh, comparing those two uh, three-month periods between December and February for our Virginia location. So um, the savings can be substantial and help justify uh, your energy program in terms of uh, your personnel and or uh, investments. So the savings can be very real through these kinds of programs. Uh, for us, um, we were able to integrate this with our 14,001 uh, energy uh, environmental management system. We really just created two icons on the front of our database, which is a web-based program. And uh, so I think seven elements out of 17 or 18 major elements of the program were easily uh, addressed or readily addressed through our 14,000 program and uh, really just expanded that to include our energy program. Uh, the challenges for us was for, for it being a fast track. Uh, we started in June 2010. We were targeting a certification by August 2011. We had limited internal support and uh, needed to uh, recruit some ex external support, which we uh, used uh, a lady, Peg Hopkins, uh, helped us with 14,000 back in 99 and 2000. So we brought her back in with her uh, systems experience and her database. We actually used her database for 14,000 and uh, integrated that for 50,000. So um, we had to slow down a little bit while ANSI and um, ANAB worked with our, our certification body or verification body, uh, DECRA, to uh, create a pilot for um, DECRA to be the first one certified in the U.S. And, and subsequently us to be the first one certified in 50,000 and, and SEP. So that kind of created a little extra pressure. Uh, during the audit process, having the uh, ANSI and ANAP bodies here uh, at the same time with DECRA. Uh, overall, I'd say it was the toughest certification of all standards. Uh, SEP certainly adds a challenge to that certification. But um, overall, uh, I'd say that uh, 50,001 was probably our uh, bigger challenge since we had already achieved the uh, energy footprint, footprint reductions. But uh, as I mentioned before, the savings in energy and uh, overall program has been an enormous of benefit, so I think even though it's probably one of the toughest ones to, to work through for certification, I think it has the greatest benefit over any other program, uh, both from an environmental and an energy point of view. As I mentioned, uh, we did a pilot certification. The audit was a dual path. It proceeded side by side. Uh, we did look at a um, sequential audit because of our availability of personnel within the plant to address the uh, a dual audit uh, side by side, but uh, we were able to pull it off side by side. We actually had a large training room with a divider and um, had both audits going on side by side. So people were walking back and forth uh, rather fluidly. Um, probably one of the key things to keep in mind is scheduling these elements. Uh, when you do the side-by-side -side audit, it's very important that you uh, 
work through the uh, scheduling of the audit with the uh, certification body uh, rather carefully and look closely at what their personnel availability is and how you match up to that and and you find that you frequently want to want to uh, meet somebody on the floor and so the floor people that you want to meet there need to recognize that the, they might have to maintain some flexibility with that so uh, I think that was actually one of the interesting points of the critique uh, from one of the verification bodies towards Decker it was just uh, how fluid that process was and how dynamic it was and they seem to express some concern over that. So that just really says that it is a, a very dynamic process. And I guess I'll leave that there. Um, phase two, you have a phase one and a phase two audit. Uh, phase one is what you call a read, readiness review. Uh, in our particular case, um, that particular part of the audit, the phase one of the audit, did not fully uh, address uh, the item listed below in 4.6.1e, the monitoring, measurement, and analysis. Uh, so we had in our mind that we could probably do some of this on the after the uh, certification, but we had to, uh, as a result of the audit, quickly move to get some uh, additional baseline work done and, uh, in our case, spend some more money on that baseline work uh, with our ovens. So. Um, you will find that even with 50,000, in order to uh, meet that requirement as you work through your uh, significant energy units, uh, there could be uh, some expenses, uh, commitments. There might be some timeline commitments that you'll need to work through uh, to be ready for the phase one audit, the readiness review. Uh, with us working with DECRA, and they had to get their certification from ANAB and ANSI. We had some time to resolve this issue before uh, they re received their uh, certification, so we were able to nail that down in January of this year and be ready when they were ready to receive their uh, certification, which I guess is due any day from ANAB. Um, so just be aware that with your significant energy uses and how you identify that, uh, is a very critical part of your activities in getting ready for uh, a certification audit. In the final review, uh, we did have that uh, deficiency. It was resolved uh, before phase two was, uh, or should have been resolved before phase two was uh, actually initiated. But since we had it all bundled so closely together, uh, things were moving along rapid fire. But uh, and as I mentioned, we were able to get that done in January. But um, the phase one should point out any deficiencies in that way. And a phase one readiness review, just to elaborate a little bit on that, that's really not so much reviewing your documentation and all your data. It's asking you questions. Have you looked at this part of the uh, standard? Have you looked at this part of SEP? And have you addressed this? So you need to be able to answer all those questions with an, an affirmative. Um, 50,001 versus SEP, uh, as I mentioned, 50,001 can be rigorous. Uh, there is uh, the energy review component, uh, making sure that you address all your energy sources and account for those. There might be some exemptions from that if they're fairly small sources of energy use. Uh, for your SEUs, you will need to look at monitoring, measurement, and analysis. And really, how much money you spend and how your program goes is dependent on how you prioritize and rank your SEUs. And for us, it might be ovens, compressors, and motors. And uh, ovens were the highest uh, priority item, highest energy use. But you know, within that, we had eight ovens. So um, how you set up your ranking criteria is a very important element of the whole program. It really dictates how you will proceed and you might have to spend a little more money up front to do some of the installation of flow meters or monitoring efforts, uh, but that also might create uh, the greatest reductions in energy use uh, and that would all depend on whether you're trying to achieve a 5% 
in three years or 15 percent or more. Uh, so that's a critical part is your ranking and how you do that. Uh, ISO 50001 will have some metrics and it does have cost involved so it is not the same as 14001. It's not the same as 9000. It does have uh, some rigor to it and it goes beyond what you would ever expect in a 14,000 program. SEP, uh, of course, has the pres prescriptive targets that you have to meet over a period of time, and you do have a tool that's available in the public domain through Georgia Tech and DOE to uh, measure that. So uh, somebody asked me what I thought of the program in, in some earlier discussions, and I don't know how many of you have a 14,000 background, but I equated this effort to doing a 14,000 certification at the same, same time that you're doing an environmental compliance audit. And any of you that have been through one or both of those and to do those both at the same time know that that's a, a pretty tough week. Major topics, uh, we had a discussion with one of our uh, co-participants in the Southeast demonstration and we talked about some of these topics, these are some of their questions that they asked about. And uh, communications of goals is very important. You want to make sure that everybody on the floor knows your achievements for the year before. If there's some cost savings you want them to know, they, they all need to know that, especially associated with your SEUs. But, you know, if it's the fact that you saved 15% last year overall in your energy intensity, that should be well communicated with your you know, newsletters, plasma screens, or whatever. Um, we could have done a little better job of that, and we're trying to do better even now. Um, and, and they should know the current year, what your goal is for this year, and, and what they can do to help the company or help the plant achieve that. For a review of procedures, they read those thoroughly. Uh, they reviewed our document control. There was a lot of lengthy discussions about that, looking at our... Uh, equipment list, uh, our energy maps, our calibration, calibration records, uh, method of recording, even per recording production. How do we keep track of trucks going off the line? Uh, you know, whether it's a bar scan or somebody fills out a form. So how you track production can be very important because that's a, an important part of your uh, energy intensity calculation for SIP. Um, for us, integrating this with 14,000, it became a, something that was readily achieved uh, in terms of document control and, and our existing database and the way we use it now for 50,001 also. Monitoring and measurement, I probably have said enough about that. Uh, just uh, pay careful attention to that as you go forward. On the, the previous couple slides, we identified where that needs to be addressed. Design and procurement of energy services, products, and equipment. Uh, we had an extensive uh, review of that and uh, review of the process. Uh, we have ways of tracking that through our capital request uh, from engineers throughout the plant and any process changes. Again, that all goes through our, uh, our database, and it's well managed at this end using a database to track those uh, requests. And, and that includes even maintenance changes. Uh, contractor management, we have a contractor management portal in our database, an FTP site where uh, contractors that are solicited for new work on site or otherwise are uh, required to review uh, contractor briefing packages and fill out our environmental and energy packages there and upload those onto the database for review by energy or environmental staff. Senior management with support, we talked about that. Uh, it's key and critical that the front office uh, supports the program. Uh, I would probably think it would be rather dubious if you could achieve this without very strong support from the front office. Compliance with legal and other requirements uh, became an interesting point of discussion one afternoon for us, and you need to be able to demonstrate that you had a compliance review of those particular items that you describe in your system. Topics uh, for the superior energy performance. Uh, 
One is demonstration of the details of the energy savings projects. Uh, when you do your bottom up, uh, if you read the MMV protocol, it'll talk about estimates. It'll talk about uh, uh, maybe even course estimates about what each project is. But we have the fellow on site that actually developed the MMV protocol. So at least in our case, we didn't get by with uh, just laying out estimates, I, I guess you would say. Uh, they, uh, Steve went through these things fairly rigorously. Uh, he needed to be able to understand that from the bottom up, those projects represented 95% of the energy use in our plant. So you need to be comfortable with that and check your unit of measures. Uh, they wanted to confirm through our energy supplier what the uh, energy value was of our natural gas, uh, who, uh, if you're using um, cooling days or heating days who you use for uh, your meteorological data. Uh, the Georgia Tech folks are very strong on using NOAA and nobody else, not, not underground weather and things like this. So very strong proponents of just using the NOAA national weather sites. Um, need to confirm those savings and ensure that that list of projects adds up to 95% of your claim. Um, the other bullet, the other item is demonstrating that you have a qualified internal auditor to audit your SEP uh, energy performance tool. And so you need to document how you're going to do that. And in our case, we've gone to Georgia Tech training. We've been to the certified practitioner training. And uh, we uh, reference those particular types of training for that kind of a competency to be able to review our energy advisors uh, work on the ENPI tool. So that was an interesting discussion also. Um, I'll turn it back uh, to our uh, coordinator for today. And uh, thanks to Paul for allowing me to be a part of this and our Yale folks. And uh, I guess uh, if there's any questions. Great. Um, thanks, Steve. Uh, we momentarily lost Paul. I think he's signing in back right now. I'm there. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, so uh, we've gotten quite a few questions in. So uh, let's start with a couple um, for Stephen first. Um, our first question from Anthony. Can you please talk in a little more detail about some of the site-specific changes um, that you accomplished as a result of ISO 50001 certification? Uh, at one point you had mentioned that there were ovens that you were adjusting the use. Can you, can you talk a little more detail about sort of like, you know, what you guys were able to accomplish or what changes you made on the manufacturing floor at your facility? Well, if we look at 50,001, uh, what that brought to us in terms of new activities, it was the ovens. There's eight ovens for all of our spray booths. And in that particular case, um, we're spending uh, upwards of a, about 150,000 in our case to install flow meters and in, and to go through our panels to monitor energy use for each one of the ovens, both electricity and natural gas. Um, you don't have to spend that much money. I think our, one of our sister companies from the demonstration program are looking at just one oven for their eCoke booth. So I think they're probably only going to spend 10 or 15 percent as much you know, to accomplish that for their SEU. Um, one thing that you know, we we are just we've done the baseline work on that particular effort, and that's really uh, that's starting at the baseline level. Uh, we are part of our uh, activities going forward. Is we have the flow meters on order, the other electronics monitoring systems are are on order, and will be installed in short, fairly short order. Uh, what we've done with the ovens early on, uh, maybe upwards of uh, six to eight nine months ago was to actually look at ways to um, turn the ovens off before the end of the shift because the temperature holds in the ovens for a period of time. And so we saw uh, where, you know, on an eight-hour shift, you might be able to cut back 45 minutes of heating for that oven, uh, upwards of 45 minutes in some cases, to where you actually shut off the heating of the oven and the, the residual heat of the oven cures the paint job uh, with the existing heat, and uh, no additional heat has to be added. So you know, you, you might say that that might readily calculate out to be a, a 10 to 15 percent 
savings for those ovens where you accomplish that uh, staging of your energy use. Um, so that's directly related to ovens uh, at this point in time. Great. Uh, one more question for uh, Stephen. Uh, so you mentioned that Volvo has a, a really strong environmental focus, um, and it's been ongoing since the early 2000s. Um, can you talk a little bit more about sort of what drove this focus? You had mentioned at, during your presentation that management support is really important. Do you think your facility would have moved towards ISO 14001 and 50001 compliance had this sort of push from um, top-level management not been there? And also, during this process, in terms of any additional costs, um, third-party auditing, was a financial support from the Volvo headquarters? Was it really there um, in order to help you guys make sure that you achieve this certification? On this particular certification, uh, what, what's happened traditionally uh, at this site is uh, we've taken our Volvo uh, corporate uh, goals and taken them to heart and uh, tried to achieve those as quickly as possible. And um, we operate, in, and sometimes the organization changes, but the, our, our headquarters is out of Greensboro. And at certain times, we've been responsible to uh, international manufacturing, and at other times, we operate as North America and, and are somewhat separate or franchised uh, separately from um, the global programs. And right now, we're back into uh, an international situation where we report up through, um, of course, Western Hemisphere to, to Gothenburg. Um, what we've had over time, I'm, and we've gone through managers in the late 99 that uh, uh, came in from a car manufacturing facility and really just gave the mandate that we be EMS certified. and. Uh, and uh, no excuses, but I never really perceived that he was uh, one of the more environmentally friendly types. Uh, uh, in his case, uh, in the late 1999, uh, you know, in most production situations, you're going to have people that are really focused on production, but uh, I'd say nine out of ten times we do have good support, excellent support from the front office. Uh, We've, we've seen some that, you know, just challenge you to get the job done and go forth, and then others that are really working with you to, to get funding. Uh, I mentioned Patrick uh, Colonon, uh, very, very supportive, uh, front office support, uh, very uh, clever in the way that he seeks out funding for other programs and uh, for this program. So. Environmental is a very important part of uh, Volvo corporate, the sustainability, the sustainability report at the corporate level. We have standards, uh, we have production standards that require uh, wastewater, for example, to would prefer that you go to a total recycling program for processed wastewater, uh, no noise, you know, beyond the fence line or very low noise at the fence line. So for every one of those elements, we have minimum and wanted positions that we strive for. And one of our positions now with energy uh, five years ago was to try to achieve 50% carbon neutral, and now it's uh, towards 100% carbon neutral. So we have those mandates. Uh, but most of the impetus comes from the plant level. Not all the Volvo plants have been as aggressive as we have been at this plant in trying to achieve uh, the Volvo standards. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Um, now we're going to move on to a couple more questions that are about um, ISO 50001 and the Superior Energy Permits Program a little more broadly. Um, so our question from Kevin is, can you talk a little about how the Superior Energy Performance Program, um, how it will compare or integrate with Energy Star Portfolio Manager? Uh, on the industrial side, it would um, I guess there's not really not a correlation on the commercial side. It will direct uh, very directly. Uh, portfolio manager will be the tool uh, to be used as part of SCP commercial. On the um, industrial side, we don't have the uh, number of sectors that are benchmarked like we do in the commercial side. 
So um, we have developed a tool, we call it the ENPI tool, that um, Stephen alluded to that Georgia Tech has developed, that is a statistical regression analysis tool that is supportive of the SEP measurement verification protocol to be able to measure uh, the, a normalized energy intensity of the improvement. So um, kind of unlike the portfolio manager, which is really uh, trying to benchmark your facility against other similar facilities, SEP is more about uh, benchmarking yourself or measuring yourself, right, and, and your continual improvement. But again, on the commercial side, since the portfolio manager is so widely used, uh, we're going to use that tool um, to build off of, to, to gather data but on the building side. hope that's clear. <laughs> so. Great. Um, this is something might be a question that both uh, Stephen and Paul can answer. Um, can you please go, Pablo asks, can you please go into a little more detail about how manufacturing organizations can calculate an energy baseline, um, particularly for a company that manufactures a wide variety of different products, um, and a lot of these products might require different levels of energy input during the manufacture. So how do you sort of tag um, your energy uh -huh. consumption to your production efforts if you're producing, you know, Volvo, you know, a lot of vehicles, but, you know, you're producing a lot of different kinds of vehicles or even a different company that's producing dramatically different products? Right. Well, of course, I, I assume that question is a lot of different products within one facility that's going for certification. Um, you, you do have to um, invest in some sub-metering uh, to do it properly. And this uh, ENPI tool does give the flexibility to have multiple products and to assign uh, and allocate energy for, for those different products and to do the statistical analysis, um, selecting and identifying your key, um, the most significant, um, statistically significant variables, independent variables for the various products. Not, a, not an easy thing, but it can be done. Um, and we're actually trying that out through the demonstrations now. Great. Um, our next question is from um, one of our viewers, and he asks, who will perform the third-party auditing and verification of the Superior Energy Performance Program? Um, are auditors going to be required to achieve specific certification, um, such as being a LEED certified or ASHRAE certified? Good question. Um, the, the verification bodies is, is an organization that will have to go through an accreditation process through ANSI and ANAB. It's a combined um, cooperation between those two organizations. So they will apply. They will follow a new ANSI standard under development called 50,028. Those are the accreditation rules. Um, right now, uh, DECRA is the, the organization that went in and did the Volvo audit, and they are um, awaiting their accreditation, which, which should be in a month or so. And then once that, that allows the 50,021 standard to be um, completed, and then other companies will be able to apply. And so there's you know, competition in the marketplace for these auditors. With regard to individuals uh, and their qualifications, uh, we are um, recommending that, that um, people have to have one or two qualifications that are currently under development. One is called SEP Lead Auditor. It's an extension above uh, the ISO 50001 Auditor, adding in um, you know the performance part. And then the second one is called SEP Verifier, Performance Verifier. And this would be a person that would deal on the on, as part of the auditing team, as part of the energy um, performance improvement. So uh, no, we, we wouldn't be lead. Um, certification and let's see the other one, ASHRAE, no, not that, but there'll be similar certifications that really focus on two things, knowledge of management system and knowledge of energy and um, the, the analytical rigor around calculating the complexities of, um, you know, in, in measuring the performance improvement in an industrial facility. 
Great, thanks. Um, our next question is from Monica, and she had a question regarding uh, the Global Superior Energy Performance Partnership. Um, so she's kind of wondering, you know, how do we contact um, their country representative? And we're wondering, can you talk a little bit more also about um, sort of where the other countries stand? Are they using the same standard in terms of the gold, silver, and platinum ratings? Um, and what are, what are their internal development practices like? Are they also rolling it out? If you could talk a little bit more about that, please. Mm -hmm. Probably Monica needs to email me uh, and ask which country she'd like to contact. Uh, there, there is a GSEP website, but I'm not sure all the current contacts are on it. So just email me, Monica. But um, in terms of um, probably the, the, the answer is no. Uh, people are not, countries are not wholesale adopting the U.S. program. Um, they generally are all um, wanting to adopt 50,001 with the exception there's a couple of countries still warming up to 50,001, such as Australia, uh, but you know Japan and um, Korea, South Africa, Canada are all bought into 50,001. Um, so what we're doing is seeing how do we take 50,001 and uh, develop similar programs to what the U.S. is doing. Um, probably uh, the, the country which will be the most similar to the U.S. is Canada. We are working with them to stand up uh, an equivalent program in Canada. So they are they're working with us to see what we've done. Great. Um, so we got time for one more question. Um, so Stu asks, what are the long-term potential opportunities for um, the, uh, the Sphere Energy Performance Program? And uh, how wide do you, do you hope to see the adoption of uh, the program being for a lot of different facilities in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. We've done internal analysis at DOE, and we feel there are 20,000 facilities um, of the 200,000 manufacturing facilities that show a clear uh, return on investment of implementing this program. That That is, uh, say, said a little differently, the, the uh, amount of effort you've got to put in to put the management system in place, taking into account your internal staff time, the money you got to spend for the third-party auditor, we feel you've got to probably have at least a, a million dollar a year of energy bill and more, although there are a few facilities at about a half million dollar a year that are doing the SEP. If you look at the number of facilities, there's around 20,000 facilities in the United States that fall into that criteria of above a million dollars, and they represent about 80% of the in manufacturing energy footprint. Um, so that's on the, on the industrial side. On the commercial side, uh, we're still in the pilot stage, and um, generally we're seeing that if it's going to work in commercial, it, it looks pretty good for large college campuses and large hospitals, uh, areas where, um, you know, the energy bill is large, and realize that, you know, there already is Energy Star uh, in the commercial sector. Um, so it, it, there are certain sectors that, you don't have the, the benchmarking there uh, that SEP might be attractive uh, for organizations to pick. And uh, it really all comes down to, I think, uh, how widely the utilities uh, work to adopt this program and to work with their industrial and commercial customers. Uh, that will uh, create a lot of uh, incentive in the marketplace to uh, try SEP out. Great, thanks. Um, so we're all out of time. Um, that concludes our talk today by Paul Shine and Stephen Purette. We'd like to thank Paul and Stephen for taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us this afternoon. This talk will be made available through Yale iTunes University and can be found by searching for the, rate, for the phrase Blueprint for Efficiency in iTunes U. If you would like a copy of the presentation or a link to our iTunes U page, please visit the Yale Center for Business and the Environment website. All Blueprint for Efficiency links are located under the Outreach tab. We thank you all for joining us for the Blueprint for Efficiency. This is Joe Tang from the Yale Center for Business and the Environment saying so long from New Haven, Connecticut.